Hope you brought your rain boots, folks, because today we're headed into the jungle of Malabaltor. This sweaty armpit of the Valenwood is teeming with sights to see, including trees, werewolves, more trees, and more werewolves. Welcome to the penultimate zone for the Aldemary Dominion. Fortunately, Malabal Tor has very little spoilers or carryover from previous zones in the series, so you don't need to watch the other episodes to understand this one, but it is still highly recommended. If you do want to catch up and check and browse all the videos in the series I've made so far, I made a playlist sorted from oldest to newest, so you can just click once and enjoy the show. Welcome to a Skyrim player tries to 100% the Elder Scrolls Online, where I lock myself into each zone one at a time, only allowed to leave after it's been 100% complete. And we're not talking about the basic 100%, we're talking about the full zone guide. All fish, all books, all achievements, all side quests, everything must be completed before I can move on. I'm going to try and play ESO more like the developers intended. No spamming through dialogue, no skipping to the best mob farming locations. We're going to treat each zone like it's its own standalone experience. Obligatory thank you to all the members of this channel for making these videos possible. Channel members get access to exclusive content and are a great way to support me directly if you're enjoying my stuff. It's completely unnecessary, but I appreciate it all the more. So, so let's get serious for a second here, okay? Malibel Tor almost broke me, and I'm not saying that to be funny, I'm not saying that to be clickbaity. This is the first time where I felt like I didn't want to play the Elder Scrolls Online anymore. In terms of commitment, it was ironically the fastest zone in the Dominion storyline by a country mile, taking me under 13.5 hours to 100% complete. 4.5 hours faster than the previous record holder, Greenshade. Now granted, I started playing this game on PC less than a month ago, so I'm sure I am getting better and faster with the controls, but the primary reason this zone is so short is the main story. The main story took me a whopping 80 minutes to complete. Eight. Zero. Minutes. And you guys know me, I play slow as hell, I listen to every line of dialogue, I talk to optional NPCs, I play the game like a single player experience, and it took me 80 minutes to do the main story. Before Malabal Tor, the shortest story was Grotwood, coming in at just over four hours long. This is the first time we've ever put the story in the grind category of the video series. It's also ironic because it was super short, and normally the grind category is reserved for activities that take a considerable amount of time to complete. We're going to talk about this more in the story segment of the video, I promise, uh, but the story was so short and unrewarding, I actually stopped playing for a few days. I just completely lost interest, and that's never happened before. So let's talk about fishing. Last video, I completely forgot to throw up all the names of my amazing bait donators, so you'll see that at the bottom of the screen now. I make sure to keep track of everyone who sends me anything in the mail, no matter how small, but if you do want to send me something, my username and server is in the description of the videos. When it came to the actual fishing, I was very lucky in Malabal Tor. I did a little bit of fishing on stream with you guys, but saltwater was the only water type that took me more than two holes to catch all the fish. Basically for fowl, river, and lake, it was two holes or less. I actually got all the fish I needed in one fowl hole, so that was cool. Fishing I know is completely tied to luck, but it was very fast in Malibu Tour, so I'm thankful for that. Of course, I used my purple fishing soup and sharp my goat of a companion, so those probably contributed to the speed of the activity quite heavily. The world bosses were pretty easy. Some of them put up a fight for sure, and I had to sit and wait for another player to walk by and help, but I soloed three or four of the world bosses on my own. There are a lot of single enemy world bosses in Malabal Tor, which I find is very easy for me to defeat as an Arcanist. I just sit behind my companion who tanks for me, and I just DPS and heal him when I need to. It's the world bosses that have two or more entities that I find very difficult, because for whatever reason the ESO AI for the companions only tanks one thing at a time, so when there's more than one boss entity, I usually have to wait for another player to walk by. Finally, of course, we're going to talk about the points of interest, and the point of interest were done much better in Malabal Tor compared to Greenshade, which I did have some complaints about. Only four were completed at the time of finishing the main story, so there's 15 more you need to venture out and complete on your own. The average point of interest mission time was roughly 18 minutes long, with the shortest being 4 minutes and the longest being 35. It took roughly 5 hours to do all the point of interest, and this by far was the longest activity in the entire zone. 
The points of interest were responsible for almost 40% of all playtime in Malibu Tour, which I think is a new record for the series. We're going to touch more in depth on the actual content of these stories later in the video, and if you're interested in the missions I thought stood out in terms of quality, stay tuned till then. You guys keep asking in my comments about a new character segment or an overview segment where I just talk about my experience and my character loadout. We'll try it out in this video. You guys can let me know what you think. Uh, if you're not interested in this segment, feel free to skip ahead to the story part. I'm just going to talk about what gear I'm running, what my thoughts about the Elder Scrolls Online are so far, just some basic stuff. So I, I have a total of 108 hours in the Elder Scrolls Online since I started this challenge roughly about a month ago. I bought ESO for like $7 back in 2020 on Steam, but if you didn't know, I actually used my dad's account because he quit and he already owned most of the DLC. That's why I'm CP700 with just over 100 hours. Obviously, I don't think that's physically possible normally. Now, my dad did own most of the DLC by 2018 standards, but I was also gifted every other DLC I didn't own by Sergeant Jeff Mongoose. Hopefully I pronounced that right. My account is now fully loaded and has access to every single zone I could ever want thanks to Sergeant Jeff Mongoose. So huge shout out there. That's without a doubt the biggest donation I've ever received. Speaking of big donations, I was also gifted a tidy 15 million gold by VRSXGT. I don't know who you are. If you're watching this video, thank you very much. Uh, with that money, you guys suggested on stream that I buy five pieces of the Deadly set and five pieces of Order of Wrath. So in the green shade video and this video, most of it, I'm using those two gear sets. However, right near the end of Malibu Tour, I was gifted a legendary armor set by Sounds Not Straight. I've never seen this before. It, it's like a 12 piece set. Normally there are five, right? I did put it on and play with it a bit. I, I think it's worse in damage wise uh, compared to the armor sets I was running before. But if you can't tell already, I'm pretty OCD when it comes to video games. And I really like how it's just all my gear. It's all 12 pieces right of the box. I don't have to worry about it. So I'm gonna keep using it for now. Uh, here are my character attributes on screen. I swapped from Magicka to Stamina because I found I was always full of Magicka but low on Stamina. People keep asking in the comment sections of my videos what I think of the Elder Scrolls combat. Uh, I guess a lot of people think it's bad, but I think the combat's pretty cool. I don't really have any issues, especially coming from Skyrim because the combat's almost the same. I, I do find the story bosses are a bit of a joke. It, it doesn't feel good to one-shot a final story boss with a single beam. I know they do level scaling or whatever, and that's why they're weak, but if you want my opinion, the dodgeable mechanics should be a one-hit kill if you fail. You know when they do an attack and there's like a circle around them or a, a red line? I think if you fail the dodge, you should be insta-killed and you have to try the fight again. At least give me the impression of danger. If you're gonna do the level scaling, that's fine, but if I can kill the boss in three seconds, he should also be able to kill me in three seconds. You know, I, I shouldn't be able to stand still and just ignore all the attacks and just melt them down. I, I think that's stupid. Okay, so before we jump into the story summary, we do a segment called Notable Characters to help refresh your knowledge on the important characters of each zone. Razum Dar is not here, okay? He's not here, I don't wanna hear it. He's not in Malibu Tor. He doesn't even show up to the wedding which is the whole major plot point of the story, okay? He's he's nowhere to be seen. I swear to God, man, the amount of people who ask me about that cat, it's unbelievable. Malvator has three main characters. The Silvernar, who are very close friends with and know quite well from Greenshade. Originally, he was just an elf named Indenir, but after he saved Valenheart from exploding, the forest decided to promote him to the Silvernar. The Green Lady, who's arguably the most important character in this zone, she's to be wed to the Silvernar, but the entirety of Malvator is being overrun with wood orcs and werewolves. Her subjects are being slaughtered by her enemies and they pose an imminent threat, so she's kind of occupied dealing with them for most of the story. The main antagonist is the Hound, and no, not that one. The Hound is sort of a tragic character. He grew up and he was in love with the Green Lady all of his life, but when she was assigned the role of the Green Lady by the Valenwood, she had to leave him. Obviously, that would make someone upset and he renounces the Green Pact and seeks favor with the Daedric Prince of the Hunt, her scene. As I said, this story is very fast and there's not many other characters who have a significant impact on the narrative. So I guess with that out of the way, we'll dive right into the story recap. Usually these are around three minutes long, but I, I doubt I'm gonna hit that mark with Malbal Tor. When you get to Malbal Tor, Valen Harbor is overrun with wood orcs and red guards. These two groups coordinated a strike and dealt a powerful blow to some of the Dominion guards stationed there. You're tasked with repelling the threat from the town and rescuing some of the townsfolk. 
After you've pushed out the hostile forces, the Green Lady herself thanks you. She says she wants to understand why the Wood Orcs attacked Valen Harbor, since until now, they were allies with the Wood Elves. You go to their encampment, but they refuse to speak with the Green Lady. She asks you to sneak in, and you discover the Wood Orcs are under the influence of an entity calling itself the Hound. When you speak to the Hound, the Wood Orcs capture the Green Lady and imprison her in some kind of magical bind. You slay the defenders of her prison and free her. When she was taken prisoner, the Green Lady learns that more Wood Orcs have taken the Silvernar and his escorts captive in a different encampment. She also thinks that she knows the Hound and believes it to be her previous partner. You rush to where the Green Lady believes the Silvernar is being held and discover he's also being held in some sort of magical prison. He's able to speak to you through a projection and describes how you can save him and his advisors. You fight your way to where the Silvernar is being held, but one of his advisors must sacrifice their life in order to free him. After freeing the Silvernar, he invites you to his wedding in the capital city of Silvernar. To no one's surprise, the city is overrun with werewolves controlled by the Hound doing everything he can to stop the marriage. You discover the Hound has brainwashed the Green Lady with the help of her scene, so you need to break the spell by killing the Hound. Once the Green Lady is released from the Hound's enchantment, she proceeds with the ceremony and marries the Silvernar. Ah, <sighs> yep. That's it. That is the main story of Malibu Tor. Normally, I have to spend quite a bit of time in this segment ensuring the recap is less than three minutes, but there's just there's just not much going on in this zone, man. As suggested by you guys, I'm going to split my impressions of the main story into pros and cons. Things I think it did well and things I think it didn't do so well. Please keep in mind, everything said is my opinion. I am new to the game, so I may miss some details, but I do tend to keep a pretty good record. So let's start with the main story weaknesses. I don't think I need to say it, but this is the worst main story I've done in ESO so far. 80 minutes. Need I say more? I go really slow and I listen to every line of dialogue for these videos. 90% of you don't. 90% of you probably blasted through the main story of this zone in what? 20 minutes? 30 minutes? You know what really pissed me off? The Silvernar barely remembered me. I was legitimately excited to see my boy again, and he spoke like a stranger to me. Maybe maybe I get too invested into RPGs, but we saved the world together. I feel like we should be more than just acquaintances. And it's not like he forgot. Immediately, he recognizes who you are, but it's never brought up again. I'm about to spoil a little bit of the Greenshade storyline, so if you haven't seen that video, you can click off and do so now. But the Silvernar never references how you knew him before he was the Silvernar. He doesn't reference how you and him saved the Valenwood from the corruption of Prince Naaman, and he never mentions the Staff of Magnus, which again, where is the Staff of Magnus? This item was hyped up to be one of the most powerful artifacts that the Dominion desperately needed to secure peace, and it's nowhere to be seen. In Lord of the Rings, the first movie is clearly about this seriously powerful and important ring, right? Everyone knows that. Imagine if the next two movies aren't about it at all. Like, people are just like, oh, nah, bro, it's chill. We just don't, we don't really worry about it anymore. What do you mean you don't worry about it? How is it not mentioned even in a point of interest? You know, you talk to some random guy and he's like, oh, you know, now that the Staff of Magnus is in allied hands, we can repel the worm cultists from constantly wreaking havoc on our dead. Or, or maybe you talk to like a farmer or something and they're like, oh yeah, now that we have the Staff of Magnus, we're able to make sure people don't die of hunger. You know it's bad when I'm spitballing what the Staff of Magnus does because we're never really told what it does. We're just told it's important to the Dominion's success back in Grotwood. You know what's also criminal? The Hound is actually a really solid character once you've done the points of interest. When you're doing the main story, you just brush him off as a jealous dude who's mad his crush is marrying a different guy. It's the point of interest missions that bring out his perspective and you start to realize that, hold up, this guy might actually be justified. He has a pretty good reason to hate the Green Pact and the Bosmer culture, so why isn't that told in the main story? Why is it a side mission? The main campaign is 80 minutes long and they could have easily worked that in. I guess, I guess this is more of a comedic complaint, but the final boss battle with the Hound has a bug where he just gets up and walks away after he's dead. The animation wasn't janky or anything, he just got up and walked out the back door, so I thought it was actually part of the story. The Silvernar is like, oh my god, thank you, the Hound has finally been defeated and we're free, and I'm like, I, I don't think he's defeated, man, he just, he just walked out your back door. All right, so let, let's try and talk about the strengths of Malvaltor's main story, and I'm gonna try and be charitable here, um, but yeah, obviously this story is very skewed in my mind in terms of strengths and weaknesses. The her scene reference is pretty cool, I guess. The main story doesn't really go in depth at all about her scene. It just kind of references that the Hound is using some of his power. Her scene is probably in my top three Dajic Princes. So that was, it was cool to see. Although I, I really shouldn't say the word see because we don't see him at all. We just hear about a new Dajic Prince. This is the first time her scene's been introduced to me in ESO and he's one of my favorites, so I'll take it. The Wood Orcs were cool. 
Uh, I like how they're morally ambiguous rather than just a surface level threat. You're kind of introduced to them as they're just a simple warmongering race in Greenshade and Malvaltor, but it is interesting to see there's a bit of intelligence, morality, and complexity for a handful of the orcs anyway. Before we get into the verdict, I would greatly appreciate it if you considered subscribing and smashing that like button. These videos take a crazy amount of time and effort to make, so any feedback would be greatly appreciated in the comments down below. I got some awesome feedback on my last video. You guys really want to see a tier list of all the Aldermary Dominion zones once I finished playing them, and that sounds like a great idea. These 100% videos take me upwards of 40 hours to make, and I feel like a tier list video would be a huge breath of fresh air for me in terms of lower time commitment. Regardless, thank you guys so much for your support. It, it really does mean the world to me. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into the final chapter of this video, my verdict of the zone. In this portion, we give each zone we're in a star ranking out of five. The rating is comprised of three smaller categories, the zone itself, which includes two sub portions, the environment and the design, the main story of the zone completed through the main campaign, and finally, what I thought about all the side content the zone had to offer. I'm gonna head out of the gate with a hot take, I think Malvaltor is beautiful. I know this is going to be a divisive opinion, but I'm going to give the zone design of Malvaltor 3.5 out of 5 in terms of the environment and the overall design. I gave Grotwood a 3 out of 5 in this category, but I think Malvaltor does everything just a little bit better. Malvaltor has a really nice color palette that I've been missing from both Grotwood and Greenshade. It has the blues, the purples, the yellows, and the reds both of those previous zones didn't really have. The fauna really feels like it belongs in a jungle and almost everything is overgrown and mossy. Yes, it's another rainforest, but in my opinion, this is the best rainforest we've seen so far. In regards to the actual design, it does a better job integrating the verticality compared to Grotwood. Yeah, there's some ledges you might not be able to climb, but I never felt like I couldn't walk someplace. The cities were also better. Valen Harbor might be the most convenient city I've ever been to in this series. Everything for crafting is accessible right in the middle, along with the stable, the bank, the way shrine being less than 20 steps away. Obviously, when you first get to Valen Harbor, it's overrun with hostiles and you do the first campaign mission to flush them out, but it's a very functional city that I've grown to enjoy. The Bandari trading post is also amazing too. First time I've seen a city of this style. If you know what kind of architecture this is, let me know, but it has a really great feel to it. It's kind of Khajiiti, but kind of Imperial as well. For a simple trading post, it did a good job feeling alive and active in terms of NPCs and players. Overall, I really enjoyed the actual zone, despite many people telling me it wasn't their favorites. Oh, let's talk about the main story, and I think for the first time, I'm going to have to give something one star. It was rough, and as I said, I stopped playing ESO after I finished the main story for a few days. I had no motivation to continue because I was worried the rest of Malibu Tour would follow suit. Thankfully, it didn't, which we're going to talk about in the next category, but I was wholeheartedly disappointed with the narrative of this zone, and I don't really have much to say in favor of it. The characters are so surface level, it's unbelievable. It really relies heavily on the player completing the previous zone of Greenshade and doing most of the points of interest missions in Malvaltor to have an ounce of compassion or understanding for what's going on in the zone. Even once you factor in all this information they expect you to have during the main campaign, the story itself isn't even that great. Both the Green Lady and the Sylvanar are captured by the same dude who's trying to stop their wedding. That's the whole freaking story, man. This could have been a one to two mission pit stop during a larger story arc. This was not a standalone story by any metric. You know why I know it's not cut out to be a main story arc? Because it was 80 minutes, less than half the length of every other zone's main campaign up till now. I, I don't even want to stay on this subject for too long. I'm going to move on to the side content. If you're asking me to rank the side content for Malba Tor, the easy answer on paper is four stars. There are quite a few exceptionally strong point of interest missions that have the same impact as the main story. But that's the problem, right? They should have been main story missions, not side content. Most side content in ESO supports the main story. In my experience, about 50 to 60% of the side content in any zone is purposely made to support the primary campaign. But notice I'm using the word support. They're usually not essential to understand a character or organization's motivation or objectives. Here, here's an analogy to help bring this point across a little easier. Each zone in the Elder Scrolls Online is a sandwich. Side content generally represents the sauce, mayo, ketchup, mustard, you name it. Does it make the sandwich better and more delicious? Absolutely. But the sandwich isn't going to fall apart without the sauce. In Malabal Tor, the side content isn't the sauce, it's the bread. The whole sandwich falls apart without the bread. 
Although the bread is delicious and super awesome, it needs to be included with the sandwich. You just can't afford to ignore it. Okay, I bet no one found that more helpful, but I like sandwiches. Hopefully that illustrated my point of view a little. In Malibu Tour, the side content is essential. And although it's probably the best side content I've done so far, I feel like some of it should have been part of the main story. For that reason, I can't give it a four out of five. I'm gonna bump it down to a three. Still, absolutely respectable with some really solid missions. It's just that a large majority of the banger side quests should have been part of the main campaign. They shouldn't have been side missions. Now, I don't wanna spoil you, but if you do want my advice, do the main story until you meet the green lady, which is either mission one or two, stop, then do all the point of interest missions, then continue with the main story. Normally, POI missions support the main story, but for Malba Tor, they're essentially the foundation for its narrative structure. With that being said, I'm gonna feature some bangers in the zone that weren't necessarily required to hold up the main story. There's a Romeo and Juliet mission where a female Bosmer and a male Wood Orc fall in love with each other, and they drive their respective communities insane. Not to spoil Romeo and Juliet, but it doesn't end well for the lovers. It was a really good mission. Fall on SD Summersight. If you see my Grotwood video, you guys know I'm a Fall on SD nut. This sorcerer lady believes she's actually tracked down Fallen Nasty and thinks it was swallowed up into oblivion. She keeps trying to open bigger and bigger portals to bring it back, but it just brings bigger and bigger Daedra. You have to sort of morally wrestle with her and say, you might be right, Fallen Nasty could be trapped in oblivion, but is it worth wreaking havoc on our entire world to bring back this one city? Really good mission, not related to the main story whatsoever. It's just a really good standalone mission. As I said previously, I'm a big Hercene guy. There were two or three missions about Hercene, but the best was the Wilding Run, where you actually get to go to the hunting grounds, Hercene's Plain of Oblivion. I'm really fascinated by Hercene because he's a Daedric Prince who's basically completely neutral. He's a natural force of nature. He's one of the most worshipped Daedric Princes, but he doesn't actually seek out followers. They always come to him. I'm really glad they leaned into her scene in Malibu Tour and they have multiple missions about him. There's one mission where you actually get to talk to him, but it wasn't as good as the Wilding Run. The Delves are pretty good, probably the best in terms of diversity and quality I've done in any zone so far. Some of them even had two different side quests, which was pretty neat. Normally, Delves have one or none, so that was cool. The Public Dungeon was all right. I spent a lot of time waiting for the bosses to spawn longer than I've ever spent before. The actual group dungeon was mediocre, I would say. I did it with some of you guys on stream and I was able to listen to the story, which unfortunately was a little bland. Basically, the Dominion is worried the Malmer have a method to drown Malval Tor in a massive tidal wave. The Malmer formed a pack with the local snake ladies, so you have to go in and get rid of them on behalf of the Dominion. Not as interesting as City of Ash for sure, but still okay. So. Overall, Malba Tor gets a 2.5 out of 5 from me, a 50% rating. I don't think this will be an unpopular opinion. Most of you in my last video and in my live stream said you really hated doing Malba Tor. I don't hate the zone overall, maybe the story, but it was still okay. It was undoubtedly the weakest zone I've done so far in this challenge, and I'm going to take a bit of a break to ensure this doesn't affect my judgment of Reaper's March. For such a quick zone to complete, it felt really unrewarding, unpolished, and a bit tedious. I normally put out a video every 10 days. This one took longer for reasons I just stated, and the next one will also take longer because right now I have no motivation to play the Elder Scrolls Online after Malibu Tor. I barely got through this video. I have never had this feeling playing ESO yet. I've really enjoyed all the other zones and I couldn't wait to get back into the game. It's just, it's just different this time. I hope after a small mental refresh, Reaper's March can revitalize me back into the mindset I had before Malibu Tor. You guys have said from the beginning that Reaper's March is the best zone in the Aldermary Dominion, so I really want to make sure I do it justice. With that being said, I'll make sure to keep you guys updated over the next week or so before I jump back into the saddle and start recording again. This was a Skyrim player's perspective on being locked in Malibu Tor until 100% complete. And although it was a little bit more of a depressing episode, I still hope you enjoyed the video. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoy this type of content, and I hope to see you in Reaper's March.